Oh, hi. Hello there. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm Liv, that woman from the podcast. Oh, nerds. Three years. Okay, fine. I keep harping on that fact, but it's just that it's really fucking exciting, okay? It's exciting that it's been three years, but what's most exciting is that in these three years, the reason I've been able to keep going is that there has been so much support from all of you. You've told your friends about the show. You've given me great reviews. You've contributed to my Patreon. Everything you've done has allowed me to continue this. I mean, it's a lot of work to research and write about 4,000 words every week. And frankly, I'm not the type of person who could have or would have continued on doing this without making any money off of it. It's just too much work. But you all have made it happen for me so that I can keep this up and hopefully very soon be in a position to be doing this full time and therefore be able to give you even better content and also simply just not burn out. But that's in the not so distant future. Today, I've got your questions to answer. Well, I mean, most importantly for God, thousands of you who message me all the time, it's happened. It turns out All I needed to become pretty obsessed with Lore Olympus was an iPad. This is episode 85. Liv is finally obsessed with Lore Olympus, a three-year anniversary Q&A. So I bought myself an iPad for my birthday. And honestly, that's all it took for me to become absolutely hooked. Now, don't get me wrong, I've read the Lore Olympus webtoon before. I've been reading chapters on and off since you all started recommending it to me like every couple of days. But I was hesitant. I've said it before, but I don't love the romanticization of Persephone and Hades. I've been pretty clear about how I feel about it in the past. But man, does that not at all seem to matter when you get deep into Lore Olympus? Personally, I will still be remaining distant from that couple in the mythology, in the way I tell the stories, and in my heart of hearts. Because I really do think it's problematic as fuck. And even if their relationship ended up being pretty amiable on both sides in the mythology, it didn't start out that way, and I won't be forgetting that anytime soon. But what I love about Laura Olympus and what Rachel is doing with it is she knows that. And she's molding a story to look past that, to re-envision it into its own very separate story. It isn't the myth of Persephone and Hades as much as it's a story about Persephone and Hades. And I mean, the other characters. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but the characters. Ugh. For me, the biggest thrills I continue to binge, because I'm only on episode like 100 or so, is the other characters. The side characters who are such fun, have such accurate character interpretations, and are just like a true joy. Obviously, I love the Cupid and Psyche of it all, because I will always love Cupid and Psyche, but I really just appreciate that Cupid is just this lovely character who you just seem to like. There's little things too, like the Furies. They are very cool and badass. I kind of love them. I realized I was calling him Cupid earlier. It's obviously Eros, but whenever I'm talking Cupid and Psyche, I say Cupid. Oh, anyway, it's just, it's also damn beautiful. The art itself is just stunning. And... Honestly, based on all the other Q&As I've done in the past, I just knew that this was the number one thing you all wanted to hear from me, and it is the honest-to-God truth. I really enjoy it. Like I said, though, we will still be keeping Hades and Persephone as a very different couple in the mythology, because they were. Rachel is doing something incredibly fun and beautiful with Laura Olympus, but that is not who they were in the Greek mythology that I have ever researched. Well, on to your questions. I probably won't be reading into this microphone all the beautiful, wonderful things you've said about me because I have trouble with praise um, and uh, I can't bring myself to just praise myself on my own podcast. But thank you all for everything you said. You were all so sweet in your messages about how you feel about the podcast and what it's done for you in various ways. Uh, It makes my heart sing. This one comes from South Africa. This person asks, what happened to Cupid's kid? Did Venus cause a miscarriage or did Psyche end up giving birth because the prophecy changed? 
when she was made immortal. So was their kid born? If they were, are they mortal or immortal? And where are they? My interests are too peaked. I'm peaking. Love from South Africa. Oh, this one made me happy. Um, if you all haven't put your names in the emails, I'm not going to read them just in case you don't want me to. What a great question. Um, if I didn't answer it in the Cupid and Psyche episodes, which I assume I didn't if you're asking, that's probably because um, I don't like children. <laughs> Sometimes I forget about them and the, their fates because that's my personality. Um, so it is, according to uh, Apuleius, Psyche did give birth to their daughter. And uh, in the Roman, it seems that she is called Voluptus, which means pleasure. Um, in the Greek, her name is Hedony. We have to remember that the story of Cupid and Psyche really only appears in Apuleius's work, The Golden Ass. So essentially everything we know, everything there is comes from that. Um, it makes it a weird story where it isn't necessarily like a broad myth that you can kind of count on or that you knew that people really knew. Like the ancient Greeks probably had no record of, of that. Um, I could be wrong, but from what I know, it's truly just Apuleius. And so it's an interesting one where it's just sort of one source. This is what he says. That's where the entirety of Cupid and Psyche comes from. It seems that she has a Greek name because of uh, the term, the sort of goddess, I don't know if she's a full goddess, but uh, of pleasure. Um, but in Plato, where she is mentioned in Greek, she isn't the daughter or isn't ex at least exclusively the daughter of Cupid and Psyche. Again, because that story is all just in Apuleius. Next question comes from, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this right, Jeroen. Is there any chance you will publish your own work slash own version on mythology as a book? So I absolutely intend to do that, um, hopefully in the near future. The book I have coming out next year is on mythology, um, but it isn't uh, specifically sort of based around the podcast or my own interpretations of mythology. It obviously has my personality, um, but it isn't it isn't that work. Eventually, I do hope to have sort of a real like, let's talk about myths, baby book of mythology, which would be the, the coolest thing ever. Next from Monica. Do you think that the bad things that happen to women who disobey their fathers or left their homes, like in the case of Medea and Ariadne, are a form of cautionary tale to dissuade women from following their dreams and to stay submissive to their fathers? Is there any story where the lady did her own thing, contrary to what her family wanted, and everything went well? Hmm. This is really interesting. And I mean, probably, like, I don't have any proof of that, but based on sort of everything I know and read and all that, it seems likely that it was. I don't know about Medea, um, but I think maybe Ariadne. I don't know. It's interesting. Maybe not. Now I'm talking myself around in circles. It just sort of, they were more cautionary tales about women, about being sort of a, a woman who did what she wanted, sort of outside of the family issue, though, of course, it's linked in some way, but it's more about being like a free woman. Look what the fuck happened. The thing about Ariadne, though, is they didn't really consider it to be, um, a tragedy because she did marry Dionysus. I just think it's a shitty thing that Theseus did, but Ariadne isn't always seen as a tragic character. There is a version where, where she has a tragic end, but um, it's not the more obvious uh, interpretation of her. Next up from Michael. Is there such a thing as Greek fiction? Like, did any Greek author that we know of sit down and write a story that they knew was made up or was purposefully creating fantasy? Better yet, what about science fiction? I'd love to read a story about the ancient Greeks' vision of the future. Oh, gosh, wouldn't that be cool? Science fiction. There is a, a book you can buy now that's called Greek fiction. I mean, it's it's a couple of stories put into one. Um, I don't know the, the history on it yet. I do intend to cover these at some point, and then I can look into the whole fiction versus mythology thing. Um, but that would be a Kaliroe and Daphnis and Chloe. Next up from Karina. She says, I seem to recall that in a very early pod, you used Nemesis as a proper noun. Is Nemesis a person, god, other? If so, what's the story? Yes. So Nemesis is a goddess, very much a proper noun. She was the goddess of retribution and punishment, specializing in criminals or people who got things they didn't deserve. She also controlled happiness. She would like dole it out to mortals and make sure no one received too much, can be too happy. She was the daughter of Nyx, the goddess of the night. She was just pretty cool and badass, but she doesn't actually appear in many stories. Sometimes she's in the story of Echo and Narcissus, 
Um, actually, as the punishing, as the reason that Narcissus is punished for the spurning of Echo, in that version, it's Nemesis who causes Narcissus to fall in love with himself. Nemesis is one of those goddesses who was mentioned a lot like in a ton of sources, actually, but it's always more to do with sort of who she was and what her job was, rather than including her in many narratives. That's why she doesn't come up in the podcast very much, though one day I do want to do an episode where I just kind of tell you all about those gods and goddesses who had really important roles in Greek mythology, but simultaneously don't feature into many actual stories that I tell. That's a theme of so, so many deities because they all existed with a purpose, but that purpose doesn't necessarily get you a story. All right, this one came in through uh, the form on my website. They ask, am I or have I ever considered being a Hellenistic practitioner or practicer? Uh, no. I'm just sort of not at all religious or in need of that in my life. I love them as stories and I love thinking about the ancient world. But to me, I love Greek mythology because it was ancient. Like, I don't need it in my modern life. Um, as far as I know, to explain Hellenism is is a modern, like, current uh, way of, of worshipping the ancient Greek gods. This person also asks, do I like whale stuffed animals? Because something about a bet about people liking or not liking whale stuffed animals? I'm indifferent to, to whales. Um, what's my favorite type of alcohol? I don't know. I like a lot. Would I consider doing a scheduled Q&A like this one once a year or whatever works? I kind of already do. It just sort of comes up once a year. Um, it's sort of tended to happen, uh, because of an anniversary or at the holiday time when I'm just too busy to get a full episode out. Sometimes I can do a Q&A because of that. Next is a question from, from Mark. I'd like to know what you think about whether or not the ancient Greeks believed in the mythical stories, literally. Is there any evidence that the average person was a literalist when it came to the myths? Did more educated and sophisticated classes understand them just as foundational stories that conveyed cultural values? Would it have been hearsay hearsay to think this? Uh, Mark continues, I don't know if there's any way to know this from other writings or letters from the period, but it sure would be interesting to know. I'm curious because so many Christians are ardent literalists about the clearly mythical stories of the Bible, and it seems to me it makes them completely miss the point. I would agree on the Christianity front there, Um, but I think that's definitely true. I have this book that one day I'll get to fully reading, again, Goals of a Full-Time Podcaster Life, um, called Battling the Gods, which is actually about... um, atheism in ancient Greece and just like straight up not believing in the gods at all, which I think is really fascinating. And I I really want to read that book. Um, But that's definitely the case. I don't think that they were necessarily outwardly like, I don't believe in the gods. I don't think they exist at all. But there are people who would take it more seriously than others. I think people did believe in them. I don't know how much they were like, that happened the other day. I think they often thought of it more as like, that's what happened in their history to get them to the point where they are, where they had to worship the gods and, you know, sacrifice and everything. Um, But I think there were definitely people who didn't really believe or who didn't believe at all. And um, certainly, I mean, the philosophers talk a lot about literalism of the gods and things like that and just sort of what were stories to, you know, help them versus what they should believe actually happened. All right, this one comes from Adrian. Uh, she's got a few questions here, but I'm going to kind of paraphrase. One was, uh, if you could be the child of any Greek god, which one? I always love Aphrodite. I know she's got like all her shit problems, but I don't know. I just always feel a connection there. So I guess I would say that. I also just love Harmonia and she's the daughter, daughter of Aphrodite. So, you know, that's where it is. Um... Another question is, will there ever be an episode about Malinui? I would love to do one. Um, It's on the endless list. We'll get there eventually. And finally, what are my favorite paintings of Greek mythological scenes? Ugh, guys, great question. So I basically love everything Waterhouse ever did. I just find them absolutely stunning. But I also love that he liked to focus on women. And there's a lot of really powerful, really badass women in Waterhouse's paintings. Um, as we all know from every time I've ranted it and raved, I'm obsessed with Bernini's uh, statues, specifically uh, the Rape of Proserpine and uh, the Daphne and Apollo. I mean, they're all incredible. There's so many more, but those are the ones that come to my mind right away. 
This next one comes from Chris. It says, The Muses. I remember the Furies and Harpies, but have I ever done an episode on the Muses? Love to hear about them and have them be more than a crossword clue or vague reference in the arts. Um, yeah, I would love to do an episode on the Muses. I haven't already. Some people have been asking anyway. Uh, but honestly, they're, they don't have a lot of stories. So that's the issue with so many characters and concepts from Greek mythology is that it's really hard for me as sort of one person to tell you about these gods when there wasn't a story because this is a storytelling podcast. I do want to get there eventually. We'll find something to talk about with the Muses, but um, they're a tricky one for that reason. This next one comes from RG, who is my favorite god or goddess that doesn't live on Mount Olympus slash just, you know, minor god or goddesses. Um, I mean, I just love, I love Harmonia, like I've said before. I mean, she's a minor goddess who lived in Thebes, so I guess she counts. I love Eris. She's just a badass weirdo. I mean, there's just so many. For me, I don't have a ton of, like, favorite favorites simply because... I just love the stories and I love everything surrounding them. So it's just sort of an overall like, hey, let's talk about this sometime or that or this or let me retell you all the stories forever and ever. The next one comes from Dave. You've mentioned that you rehearse and revise. Oh, this one was the best. You've mentioned before that you rehearse and revise your podcast before posting. How did you develop your soothing yet incredibly dynamic storyteller's voice? This was the most complimentary question and also the most inaccurate. I love it. So I, um, I don't rehearse. I, I barely revise before posting. So here's what I do. I spend a day researching and writing. I sort of write as I would speak. So, you know, with the jokes and the pauses and the, uh, various, you know, likes and ugh, like, ugh, you know, I don't even know what I'm saying there. But I, I basically write everything that you guys hear on the podcast. I write it as I'm researching, just like read book, type something, uh, read a bit more, type a bit more. That's basically how I do it. And then I sit down and I record it and I edit out all my mistakes in the edits, like where I fuck up or where, you know, I burp or make a weird sound and have to cut it out. But that's it. That's it. I honestly, like, I don't know much about editing. And um, yeah, no, it seems that I apparently naturally have a a soothing yet incredibly dynamic storyteller's voice. I don't hear it, but I love that you all do. And it's just so much fun that I get to just read some stuff into a microphone and have everybody love it and think my voice is like the best for, for this kind of podcast world. It's fun. This next one comes from Danny. Would I ever consider doing an episode on the play Thesmophoria Zeusai by Aristophanes? It sounds super fitting for the podcast and would love to hear my, she would love to hear my hilarious take on it. Oh, that's very nice. Um, I, I didn't know about that one. It sounds like the worst word for me to have to read into a podcast a million times, but I'll definitely look into it. I do want to start doing more um, plays and certainly more Aristophanes. There's just the nice thing about this is it, the list is still endless. You know, I've been doing this three years and we're not nearing being done. I'm just nearing the point where I need more time in order to do it well because I'm, I'm getting a little burnt out. This next one is from Ethan. It's more of a clarifying question, he says. So in the stories, when you say Zeus or another god, goddess, put them in the stars as a constellation. Does that mean like when they died and then they are put in the stars? Or is it like right then and there, though they were alive, the god just technically kills them to put them in the stars? Or is it like the gods just arrange the stars to represent the person thing that they wanted? Um, It's about, he clarifies that uh, it's specifically about Callisto trying to save her and putting her in the sky and Arcus and her son and everything. Um, so that's an interesting one. I think the way the ancient Greeks believed it is that when they died, they got put into the stars, but that there was times where basically, yes, they, they were almost killed or they wouldn't see it as being killed. They would more see it as being like saved in a way and put up in the stars because they saw the constellations and the shapes of them as being like a form of immortality. Like you live on forever in the stars. So it was, it was very much like a good thing, even if technically it would mean they wouldn't be on the earth anymore. 
Nadia asks, which translation of the Iliad do I recommend? I wish I had a, a better answer for that. I used, um, I think his name was Stephen Mitchell translation of the Iliad. It's not the most academic, I don't think. Um, for me, it was just really readable when I was working on those episodes. Of course, I'm reading that translation by Samuel Butler, but that one I don't recommend it simply because it's in the public domain. So I, I can read it um, without dealing with copyright, which is an issue with, with all this stuff, basically because of translations. Obviously, the books themselves or the plays themselves and whatnot are in the public domain, but uh, because the translations uh, had to be done more recently. Those are copywritten. It's a funny situation, um, but but that's it. But I, th- the most exciting thing about this question is I do know that Emily Wilson, who translated that incredible translation of the Odyssey, is also working on the Iliad. So, you know, whenever that happens, I will definitely be recommending her translation of the Iliad. Next up from Sullivan, uh, they ask, as much influence as the Egyptians were on Greek culture, is there more of the crossover mythology there. As a little girl, Greek and subsequently Roman and Egyptian mythology fascinated me the most. And I'd love to hear any adventure goddess fuckery that took place. Um, I do want to do a bit more into Egyptian mythology because there is a lot of crossover there. Um, I don't think there's any sort of explicit crossover in the way that, that we would see it because that would mean they, they were doing it more for like an entertainment stance. The reason there's crossover is because they were just so close to one another. Um, and eventually the Greeks um, partially ruled Egypt and then the Romans as well. Uh, so it was just sort of they were kind of all in one. And so there was a lot of crossover just based on um, location and and people traveling and going over there and hanging out and bringing their gods and then the gods would sort of combine into Egy- existing Egyptian gods and the like. It's all very interesting. I'd love to to learn a bit more of it and do an episode on that. Jen asks, uh, I wonder if you knew of any stories about Pandora after her opening of the jar. Like, what became of her? I found a lot of different versions of her creation and the opening of the jar or box, depending on the source, but nothing about her fate. Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't think so. There's just a lot of different versions of the jar, but that was kind of the point of Pandora to the Greeks. That's another thing about them. You know, they the stories exist to prove a point, to make a point, but... um. After that, they didn't care. You know, it wasn't like, oh, let's figure out what happened to Pandora. They were like, Pandora let out all the evils into the world. And that's that. So I don't I don't think that there's much, if anything, about her after. Well, that's all for the email questions, but I did um, post a sticker onto Instagram recently and got a bunch of quick ones. So we're going to do a quick rapid fire Instagram questions. All right. Will you ever do stories of women heroes like Atalanta and such? I already have. There's an episode on Atalanta. Google it. (laughs) What's your go to dinner to cook at home? I hate cooking. I hate it. What is the misconception about the ancient slash mythology that you hear the most? I don't know. So much. It's hard to say. I mean, it's, you know, I don't know. (laughs) I just love it. I just want to correct everybody or talk to everybody and share it all. And that's my answer. If you have the opportunity to hang out with a god or goddess, which one would it be? God, all of them? I don't want to pick. I mean, it'd be really interesting to talk to Athena or like a hero or something. I can't pick. What's your favorite non-goddess character from myths? Um, I really like Cadmus. I really like focus my life around Cadmus and Har- Cadmus and Harmonia. It seems, um, but obviously I love Medusa. Um, I love uh, nymphs. They're very cool. The muses are very cool. The oracles very cool. I love everything. Um, this person says one. How are you so cool? Two. How do you find the motivation to write episodes? One. I'm not that cool. You people only think I'm cool. I'm a huge weirdo. Uh, two. Uh, I find the motivation through thank God, uh, the listeners and all you people caring about this because I totally would have burnt out by now, um, if I didn't have so many awesome people like, cheering me on and being a part of this. It's really fun. Next up, pretty standard question, but what's your favorite myth? Oh, I don't have a favorite myth. I just love them all. I just love them all. I just want to talk about them all the time. I mean, no, it's just like mood. It's what I want to talk about. It's kind of what comes up and then what I can spout off. Um, what would you be the goddess of? I don't know. Nerddom? Reading? Um, being a dork? 
If you were to spend a few days in the golden age of Athens, what would you do? Oh my God, that's my life goal. I can't even imagine. I'd go to the Oracle. That would be really fucking cool. Um, I would make sure that I caught the city Dionysia and be able to watch all those plays. Oh my God, can't even imagine. I just like, I, I would go everywhere. I would talk to everybody. I would do all the things and I would try very hard to, um, you know, not be beholden to all the awful stuff they did to women. Very cool. Are you interested in other mythologies? Yes, but less so. I just love Greek mythology too much. Uh, favorite Euripides play? Whew, don't make me pick. Maybe Medea? I don't know. The back eye is really good. I just love Euripides. Let's just talk about Euripides all the time. Are there any classics magazines that you know of? Probably. I'm not in the academic scene at all because I left academia behind me. Didn't love it. Um, but I'm sure there are. Google it. Why did the Romans take all the myths from Greeks? Is it ultimate, ultimate cultural appropriation? No, it's not cultural appropriation. I wouldn't say that at all. Um, they didn't take them. It's just that so there were Greeks in the general region of Italy before the Romans. Um, there were lots of Greeks on Sicily and just in the area and everybody traded with everybody else and everybody, you know, did their things with everybody else. And the Greeks were like huge in the whole region. And so it was more just that that's how what happened naturally. Um, and then the Romans, you know, they, they kind of like to have their own thing. So they had their own names, but they had their own names also because they had their own language, right? So they had to, they had Latin and, and so they had Latin names for the gods. So it was more language and regional. And then the Romans deciding later that they were the greatest people on the earth. So then they had to have their own thing. So then the, you know, it had to be a bit separate. Um, but honestly, like it wasn't, it wasn't that it was just like the way the region evolved and it became the Romans sort of took on that, that con those concepts because of the, the regions and who was there already and who believed what, um, yeah, it's not. It's not cultural appropriation. Has your perception of any character changed since you've dived deeper into the myths? Definitely. Um, Medea, for sure. Like, you can listen to my first episode of Medea and have a completely different experience from listening to my later episodes of Medea. I mean, all of it's true. Like, I learn more every time I do a new episode. And that's kind of why I like to redo old ones sometimes. Um, because I've learned so much more and I want to share it all with you. And so, you know, it has to be kind of redone in a in a much more detailed and, and sort of updated way. Did the Romans also believe in the Greek aspect of the gods? Or did they think their gods were original? Um, that kind of relates to what I said earlier. I don't think they thought their gods were original. Well, they didn't really think of their gods like that. That wasn't a, a concept of like a yes or no, right? It was just like, this is the way it is. Um, the Romans didn't believe in the gods in the same way as the Greeks. For the most part, they didn't see them as much as like coming down from Olympus and fucking shit up. They were just sort of more there and there to be um, worshipped and, and all those things to get what they wanted. But it was less, they were less about like, they were less, you know, human like the, the crazy characters to come in and ruin your life. Will I ever do more non-Western myths? I loved the Epic of Gilgamesh episodes. Yes, hopefully. Um, they kind of come to me in the moment. Like I said, I just love Greek mythology. Like it just, it's not the same for other stuff, but I definitely want to um, for so many reasons. You know, I just kind of have to get there. Is there any encyclopedia for all the creatures in Greek mythology? Someone's probably written one. I don't have one, but someone's probably written one. What is your favorite Greek wine that we can buy in Canada? Great question. So a Moshe Falero is a really nice, quite light um, tart, but also a little bit sweet white wine that you can definitely get here. There's there's one, I think it's Butari is the, the winery that you can get it uh, in Canada. It's nice. Why classics? Why not classics? I don't know. I love it. It's so good and exciting and cool and entertaining. Would you ever consider going through the Percy Jackson series? No, sorry. I know. I get it. I'm going to watch the show when it comes out. We'll try it that. But here's the thing. I was like 17 or 18 when those books came out. So I was just, I just felt too old and I was too cool. And I just started drinking, you know, I was too busy reading like the last Harry Potter book. So it just, it didn't happen for me and, and it won't, but I love that, that you all love them and that it spread mythology in the way that it has. That's very cool. Why do you have a number one tattooed on your hand? Do you have any myth related tattoos? 
Okay, this one's getting a specific answer. So you all asked a lot of questions about my tattoos. And I'm going to be honest, I don't really want to talk about them. I don't really love talking about myself in that way. It just feels weird and personal. And I don't know. I don't want to keep it to mythology. My personality is in here for sure. But, you know, other than that. Um, but that all goes out the window when someone asks me about the number one on my hand because it's my pride and joy. So I have a one tattooed on my hand as a footnote because then I have a corresponding tattoo on my foot. It's a footnote. Get it? And the tattoo has some, something about writing. It's it's a tattoo for, for it's a quote about writing. Um, and so the one is where the pen would sit on my hand. That's really dorky. Okay. Hello, language nerd here. Do you want to learn any languages, classical or modern? I want to learn ancient Greek so bad. So bad. Like I think when... I get to quit my job. I'm just going to use some extra time to learn ancient Greek for sure. And then maybe modern Greek too. That would also be cool. But I'm starting with ancient. If you could have a conversation with one god, goddess, who would it be and why? Oh, I don't I I kind of already answered this. I want to talk to everybody all the time. I'm not picking. Did Olympus ever fall because of a tattooed warrior? I I don't know what this means. Um, It seems a very specific question that I should understand. No. There's no. No. Any episode suggestions for new listeners? Mm, If you're a new listener, you might not listen to this one. So I don't even know if you'll hear this answer. But um, everybody seems to really love my Medusa and Arachne episode. uh, The Lysistrata episodes, very fun. Uh, My Odyssey episodes, I love. uh, Living for my new Theseus series, those are very fun. What is your favorite feminist slash female focused myth? I don't know. I don't know. I just can't. Here's the thing. Any favorite questions seem to get me because I can't pick a favorite of anything. Probably Medea, now that I'm saying it all out loud, or Medusa. But I just, I don't have a favorite. What series slash films do you recommend related to mythology ofs? Uh, I don't have any. I hate them. No, I really want like a really good quality movie about Greek mythology that's just right and accurate and exciting and it doesn't exist. And that bums me out. If you could be any Greek god or hero, who would you be? an amazon what are your thoughts on hades town the musical i don't have any i'm sorry i keep needing to listen to the soundtrack i just haven't got there if you can share is the book you're working on the cadmus and harmonia one or something new it's something new it's about greek mythology um it's something i was uh approached to write it's going to be very fun and i'm going to tell you about it really soon have you finished season one of Lore Olympus? If so, would you consider doing a mini-sode on it? So as I talked about at the beginning of this, I haven't finished season one, but I'm pretty deep into it. That said, I don't think I'll do a mini-sode just because I don't really know what I'd talk about so much. And I think it just is, you know, we all just want to read it. If you could keep only one play and the others were eradicated, which would you choose? Blasphemy? Don't ask me that. <laughs> Would you ever do an episode on New Wa or do you only feature Greek mythology? I don't know who um, New Wa is. And I don't only feature Greek mythology, but again, it's just about my passions and uh, my passions are for Greek mythology. Is there an official list of main deities? Every writer I read is different. For example, Hestia and Demeter. No, it's confusing. So there are always 12 Olympians, but who those 12 are varies depending on what you read and when. So essentially, Demeter is not always an Olympian, but sometimes she is. Hades is not always an Olympian, but sometimes he is. Hestia is not always an Olympian, but sometimes she is. And Dionysus is not always an Olympian, but sometimes he is. What is your favorite modern retelling or rendition of mythology, not including Song of Achilles? I really enjoy The Children of Jocasta, and I just got her new book, A Thousand Ships, that I'm really excited about reading. Um, That is Natalie Haynes is the author of those. Do you have any book recommendations along the lines of Circe and Song of Achilles? What a great follow-up question. I would recommend Natalie Haynes' books. Um, and also, I've said these ones before, but um, Silence of the Girls is is an interesting um, adaptation of the Trojan War. And um, C.S. Lewis, famous for Narnia, has written a retelling of Cupid and Psyche. It's called Till We Have Faces. It's interesting. It's It's different. Who's your favorite couple in Greek mythology? I've said it a thousand times. Cadmus and Harmonia. Why do you think most hate Poseidon more than Zeus, even though they're both evil? Poseidon tends to be more obvious about it. Like Zeus gets away with people thinking that he loved them or like, oh, he just wanted to go away with her. But Poseidon tends to be like violent and gross. 
What is the story slash thing that started your interest in Greek mythology? Cupid and Psyche. Cupid and Psyche and Aphrodite, which is why I love her so much. How do you handle being this amazing and incredible person every day? That is so nice of you. I don't know. I don't think of myself as particularly incredible or amazing, but it's really cool that other people do. Where did you go to college? Concordia University in Montreal. I'm going to Greece next August. Any tips or favorite places that you visited? Everywhere. I mean, Athens, see everything. Go to Delphi. I don't know. I was supposed to go in May, but I couldn't. So live vicariously. Do you think Hades and Persephone are in a healthy relationship like they genuinely love each other? This question is clearly based around Laura Olympus. So I'm going to kind of wheel back to what I originally said. Um, I don't think they're in a particularly healthy relationship in real mythology. Um, no. I mean, they they are sort of the least dramatic of the, you know, major gods relationships, except for, you know, the kidnapping to begin with. Um, but I think that we do need to keep Laura Olympus, Hades, and Persephone separate from mythology's Hades and Persephone. And in that way, you can kind of understand all the mythology and recognize the the issues if, with it and also still love Laura Olympus. How do you feel about Game of Thrones treatment of Daenerys? Sorry, I'm not over it. I'm pretty sure I talked about this in my last Q&A, so just refer to that because no one wants to revisit that. What mythology do you know most about? Why are you so interested in that one so much? I mean, based on the phrasing of this question, I would just answer Greek. But I know that's probably not its purpose and I'm just being a jerk. Um, I don't know. I, I love them all. Guys, I love them all. What's the symbology of the gods in the plastic arts? I don't really understand this question. Um, the uh, They just loved sculptures? I don't know. But the, that was their way of representing anything. They didn't really have other things. So they would sculpt gods and goddesses in mythology. Have you ever played D&D? It seems like a thing you might enjoy. I have not, and I probably would, but I don't know that I would seek out playing. Who is your least favorite god slash person in Greek mythology? Mm, that's about similar to my other, to my favorites. I just don't have any. I just love everything so much. It's so crazy. Who is your favorite god, goddess, and why? I don't know why I read that one, because it's basically the same. I've answered it a hundred times. What is a triple deity, and what the heck does it have to do with Hecate, Artemis, and Persephone? So Hecate, I know, is... um. A triple goddess in the way that uh, she just sometimes was shown with with three heads and she watched over crossroads and um, she's really interesting. But I don't I don't uh, know the connection with Artemis and Persephone other than. um, No, I don't know. Um, I'm going to look into that. That sounds really interesting. How did you like Spartacus? Oh, God, so much. I've been watching Spartacus with Ancient History Fangirl and it's the most wonderful thing in the world. They're all so pretty and ripped and sensitive and nice and there's really nice relationships shown i love it people seem to like treating athena like a feminist can you set the record straight i don't think she was not a feminist i just think that she was the man's goddess in the way that the men wrote the the, wrote the mythology and they passed it down and they did their thing and they didn't want a woman that liked other women they wanted a woman who was like a man who had manly qualities and masculinity and blah 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 i think that if athena um If we had more things that were developed by women and written down by women, Athena would have been a feminist because Athena was also badass. How do you feel about Hellenism? Have you ever considered it or spoke to others who believe in it? How does it change the way you research myths? Well, this is obviously connected to what I talked about earlier. Um, I've honestly never really looked much into it just because I don't have any interest in it. it. Like, I come to Greek mythology um, from a more historical standpoint, an obsession with the history of ancient Greece and and the things they believed and the things they wrote down. I don't, to me, it does, it's just not, I don't have any interest in in seeing it as a religion or, or seeking that out. I have always been really not religious at all. And so I just have no interest or or need for that. It doesn't change the way I research myths because for me, again, like it's history. I'm researching the myths as history, not not as anything um, current to be to be viewed current at all. It's history and I want to talk about it in the realm of history while obviously connecting it to to the things from today, but but not in a way of trying to, you know, affect anything based around what people believe now. What do you think the gods would feel about people being named after them? I don't know. I think they'd like it. They all have really huge egos, you know? So it's like, as long as you don't say like, well, I'm more beautiful than Aphrodite. I just have the name Aphrodite, you know, then you're going to be good. Well, 
that was really fun. Um, I hope you liked it. Uh, we'll be back next week with a regular episode. Thank you all for being with me for these three years or whenever you arrived, however long you've been listening. It's really cool and it's really fun. And I love that I get to answer these questions and think about mythology and the myths and characters in a way that I hadn't necessarily before because everyone's got different thoughts in their heads. And, you know, and when you guys share it with me, I get I get new ideas and I get um, to think about things differently and also kind of talk to you unscripted in a way that that's kind of fun when normally I'm super scripted, like I said. <sighs> anyway, um, you're all so wonderful. Thank you all so much for being around and for listening and for everything. This is really, really lovely. <laughs> Thank you all. I am Liv and I love this shit.